Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're very happy uh, to have our very own Kostya Makarichev tell us about solving optimization problems using decoupling. Okay. Something happened. Okay, yeah. So, so, so I will tell you, to tell you about solving optimization problems with uh, these economies of scale uh, via decoupling. This joint work with uh, Maxim Sferidenko from Yahoo Labs. And this paper from uh, Fox 2014. Uh, so I have um, sort of two versions of this uh, talk. One of them is more algorithmic, and another one is more uh, probabilistic, sort of. And uh, here I highlighted the word decoupling because this is a more, more probabilistic uh, point of view. I will uh, talk more about probability involved in our algorithm. <coughs> and, but let me start with uh, just define what uh, problems with this economy of scale are and why, why they are important. Uh, and maybe uh, many of you heard before about problems with economy of scale. So typically when you buy resources, you pay the price which is linear as the amount of resources used. Uh, in some cases, of course, you may get a discount, right? If you buy more resources, you get some discount, you pay less. But it turns out that uh, in some interesting cases, uh, the price goes super linearly. So if you buy twice as many resources, you pay more than twice the amount of money. And sort of the typical and the most important example for it is the cost of energy used for computing. So if you double the speed of a processor, then usually the speed, <coughs> sorry, the energy used by the processor will more than double. So this dependency of, of uh, the speed of a processor or other hardware and um, uh, the speed, uh, uh, sorry, and the amount of electricity used uh, is typically, it's, it's quite complex, but it is usually uh, modeled as some function x to, to a power of q, where q is between 1 and 3, and this, this q is really uh, dependent on the piece of hardware. Even for different Intel processors, this q is different. And this, this model are indeed suggested a lot in the literature. So this is sort of... Uh, the best way to model uh, energy use of a processor among sort of simple, simple ways. Right. Of course, there are more like. Uh, it de I don't know. Somehow it de depends on the electronics used there. Uh, yeah, but that's true that, that typically, if you want uh, your, your battery to last longer, you don't want to compute something too, too fast. And this is indeed even, I mean, this is used a lot in practice in operating systems and in Windows, even though m maybe the models used there are a little, a little uh, more precise. Uh, and so uh, we propose uh, some framework to solve in, uh, uh, problems with this economy of scale where uh, the objective is a um, convex function of, of the amount of resources used. Uh, so we apply it for, for uh, quite a few different problems uh, for scheduling, energy efficient scheduling, uh, energy efficient routing, and other problems. Uh, here I will show you the most basic example, uh, which is a, a energy efficient routing. So what is this problem? Uh, we have <coughs> a graph G and we have uh, demand pairs, SI, TI, DI. So SI is a source, TI is a sink, and we want to route uh, SI units of flow from SI to DI, TI um, via a single path. Another uh, way of saying it, we want, want to route D DI units of un unsplittable flow, flow from SI to DI. Uh, think of this flow as being some information sent, and we want really send all the information from one source to the corresponding sync via a single path. This is uh, often necessary in practice. Uh, this is a classical combinatorial optimization a problem. It was uh, studied a lot. What's new about this problem is the <coughs> objective function. So we want to minimize the energy use, used uh, by, by this routing. And uh, for every edge E, let's denote by, by X sub E uh, the uh, amount of 
flow routed via that edge. Uh, then we say that the energy consumed by that edge is x sub e to the power of q. And so the ten total energy used is sum over all edges Ce times xe to the power of q. So this is our model. Question so far? <coughs> C is some, some just uh, Comes from your some constant. Oh. It is part of the problem. Yeah, so uh, some edges can, can maybe have different, whatever, not resistance, but different, but some, some, some different parameters depending maybe on the length of the link. So uh, edges uh, in, in, in this graph sort of correspond to, to link in, in the actual network. Of course, the problem is quite, quite theoretical approximation of what happens uh, in practice. Uh, and one example uh, here, if you want to route this um, what, purple uh, flow from this vertex to this vertex and from this yellow vertex to this yellow ver vertex, we can find, for example, a routing like this and like, like that. Uh, then we will have four edges uh, with load one. And it means that uh, for this objective function, if all c's are equal to one, actually five, right? Uh, I think, whatever, uh, it says five. Five times one to the power of q, and two edges have load of two, it, it, it is another two times two to the q. So this is, this is the total energy consumed by this routing. <clears throat> so what is uh, known about this problem? Uh, th this problem was introduced by Andrews uh, F Fernandez, Anta, Jean, and Zhao. And they gave an approximation algorithm that the, the approximation ratio depends linearly on the number of demands, the number of source uh, sync pairs, and logarithmically on the uh, maximum demand, this Dmax. Uh, if all uh, demands are the same, uh, then uh, the same authors gave a constant factor approximation. And Bumpis, Kononov, uh, Letius, Lucarelli, and Sveridenka uh, for this special key where all demands are the same, gave p to the uh, q approximation, and here p is the Poisson uh, variable with parameter one. So this is a uh, qth moment of the Poisson random variable with parameter one. Uh, what we did in this paper, we generalized the result for arbitrary DIs, and we in general introduced a framework which uh, can be used for many uh, other different problems. Uh, so what <clears throat> okay, uh, this uh, p to the power of q may, may look mysterious, so I plotted it in the most interesting regime for our algorithm. The most interesting regime is when q is between 1 and 2. Because maybe for q is greater than 2, you can do be better using some other techniques. And <clears throat> in this case, uh, so this is the plot of uh, qth moment of the Poisson random variable. It's easy to see that it is a convex function, and at 1 it is equal to... One at two, it is equal to two, so it is always strictly less than q. So particularly we get q approximation if q is between one and two. <coughs> okay, um, first, any, any, any questions about the problem? So how does it, does it relate at all to the, the formulation to edge disjoint paths? To what? Edge disjoint paths? Uh, um, maybe, maybe you can think of it as some kind of relaxation of that problem, right? So you can reuse the same age, but then you pay, pay a penalty. Yeah. Okay, if Q tends to infinity, maybe it, is, it becomes the same problem. Okay, but again, I'm not, I'm not sure that it needs to be checked. Uh, and uh, of course, if Q is very large, then this approximation is not particularly good. I don't know whether you can recover some, some, some reasonable approximation using the scheme. I, Probably not, at least certainly a suboptimal. <coughs> okay, uh, what is, uh, how do we solve this problem? Uh, there is a standard LP relaxation for routing uns uh, unsplittable multi commodity flow. Uh, so let this calligraphic PI be the set of uh, all paths going from SI to TI. And for every path going from SI to TI, we introduce a variable lambda P which tells us how much flow is routed via this path P. <clears throat> so the constraints we have is that if you sum over all paths going from SI to, uh, 
SI to TI, the amount of flow routed via those paths is equal to DI, that's our requirement, and all lambda P's uh, are in the range from zero to DI. Of course, if it was uh, an integral problem, pro problem, then all lambda P's would be either zero or DI's, but we relax the problem. Uh, and uh, this uh, <coughs> relaxation as is has exponentially many variables, but this relaxation is very standard and there is a way to write this relaxation in a slightly different form uh, which has polynomial in many variables. So we'll ignore this issue and uh, we denote by uh, capital lambda the polytope of this uh, variables lambda sub p. And now we need to write uh, the objective function and that's the, the interesting part of this relaxation. And the most natural way of writing this relaxation is as follows. Uh, we just write it as is. We want to minimize sum over all edges E, CE times the amount of flow routed by this uh, edge E according to the linear program to the power of P. The good news is that this objective function is convex and th therefore this problem is solvable in linear time. So we co can solve it. And you may think that this is it, we, we, are, we are done, we, we solve the problem. But unfortunately, uh, this relaxation has a really bad integrality gap. And to see it, consider the following example. Uh, suppose we have uh, just one uh, sourcing pair, and we want to route one unit flow from this vertex to this vertex, but these two vertices are connected with n different disjoint paths like this, right? Then one, one possible solution is to uh, assign one over n to, ev uh, to every path. So th this is a path, right? We can assign uh, weight one over n to all paths and route flow, flow as follows. <coughs> now when we compute uh, the, um, the energy you, according to our objective function, LP function, uh, we'll get the total n paths uh, for, for every edge, we get a contribution of 1 over n squared. So the total uh, cost is 2 over n. 2 because uh, every path has two edges. But of course, any integral uh, solution uh, routes all flow via a single path. So the optimal solution has cost 2. And this is a problem. And we need to write a different um, LP relaxation for, for the problem. But, so let's see what, what is the problem. Is it a prob pro problem with this <coughs> relaxation with our variables or with our objective function? So it's common to interpret linear programs probabilistically. So linear programs give us some distribution of the solutions. In fact, they don't quite give us a distribution, but they kind of hint us what should be the right distribution, right? And so uh, this uh, solution tells us that we need to pick one of these paths with probability one over n. And this is a very reasonable thing to do. Indeed, all these paths are good, and are good so they have all of them are optimal solution. And so this distribution of paths is indeed sort of an optimal solution. So LP uh, tells us the, the truth. It doesn't cheat. It just somehow the objective function computed here is wrong. We, and uh, it means that uh, we will uh, keep uh, the relaxation as is, but we replace this objective function with something different. <laughs> so <laughs> let's look at a single edge. Let's look at this edge. Uh, and uh, what do we know? We know that uh, there is some distribution uh, of paths uh, through which we uh, route flow from one, uh, source to sink. Uh, and uh, this edge is used with probability 1 over n. What is the energy consumption, expected energy consumption for this edge? And it's clear that the answer is 1 over n, right? Because when it is, uh, the flow is routed by this edge, the energy consumption is 1, and when it's not, it's 0. And so let's try to generalize a sort of this intuition for, 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 for a general graph. So what we'll do, uh, we'll keep <coughs> uh, our relaxation as is. So lambdas are going to be as, uh, as before, the same lambdas, the same constraint, but we will replace the objective function. Again, so uh, we will uh, compute the energy consumption for every edge individually and then uh, sum up all these energy con consumptions. And the energy consumption uh, for an edge is going to be a lower bound 
on the energy con consumption possible uh, for this age. Essentially, we'll assume that uh, the flow is routed in the optimal way for that particular age, so that the energy consumption for that age is minimum, and we will uh, use that number um, uh, instead of uh, what you had before, some of uh, <coughs> this lambda i to the power, lambda p to, uh, to the power of q. Uh, so in other words, what we are going to do, we, 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 we set this function f sub q e that really depends on the age e as minimum over all distribution d e distribu uh, of, so y, y, is, y is the vector of y1, et cetera, y uh, d, uh, y, y, so what's the number, y, let's say, y k is the number of, of demands, uh, sum of y i to the power of q. And so uh, y i is a random variable that tells us uh, how much flow is routed from the source si to, to, to the sink uh, ti, right? Uh, so, okay, so, so th these are requirements on this distribution. Uh, first of all, this distribution should be sort of, uh, every y i in this distribution should be a Bernoulli random variable, or maybe a scaled Bernoulli random variable. So it should only take uh, value zero and di. Uh, then uh, the expected value of yi uh, should be equal to the amount of flow routed from si to uh, ti according to the linear relaxation, to the LP. So this should be true, and the particularly uh, this equation of course tells us what's the probability that yi equals to di and what's the probability that yi equals to zero. <coughs> and um, yeah, and then uh, essentially we know all marginal distribution and we only don't know how, what's the um, joint distribution of yi's. And we want to find this out, what's the optimal uh, distribution, and then we use this F, fqe as a proxy for the amount of energy used by that edge e. Uh, again, so it's not quite clear why we can compute fqe. It is possible to write a linear program, which will again use exponentially many variables, but it turns out that it's not too hard uh, to solve this uh, LP uh, problem almost exactly up to a factor one plus epsilon. And since this talk is, is based more on, on the probabilistic part uh, of our algorithm, I will, uh, I will skip. I, I won't tell you how to solve this LP relaxation. It's not particularly hard, and it's possible. Uh, so we can, in fact, compute this FQEs uh, in polynomial time. And this functions FQEs are convex, and therefore we can solve this optimization problem. <coughs> okay, so, right, uh, what uh, do we get? Uh, we, we got this solution lambda p's, and for every age we have a distribution of yi's, which is the best for that particular age. Unfortunately, we don't have a global of distribution of ages, uh, of paths, right? So for, for one path, we may use, uh, sorry, for one age, we, we, we may use one collection of paths to route the flow. For another age, we may use a completely different collection of paths. Uh, and uh, this is unfortunate, o otherwise you would get just exact solution for the problem. Uh, so we, we can't rely on those yi's uh, for the rounding purposes, and that's why we use the most basic algorithm uh, you can imagine uh, to route the flow. Uh, so for every <coughs> uh, SATA pair, we'll uh, take a, a path p with probability lambda p. Lambda p is scaled by, by d. So lambda p uh, was the amount of flow, so lambda p over di uh, is the probability that we use path p. So that's our algorithm, right? So all lambda p's that go from, uh, for, p, uh, for path p going from si to di, sum up to, to di, uh, so if we normalize lambda p by di, we get a probability, probability distribution. And this is the algorithm we use, that's it. The algorithm is simple. The choice of lambda p was based on this. The choice of lambda p, what's important, was used on this minimization criteria, right? So if you use a different function, the original function, then the solution would be also feasible, but it would be completely different, a priori, right? <coughs> okay, uh, so the algorithm is easy. Now we need to, to analyze. And uh, let's say that xi is the amount of flow 
uh, routed from SA to TI according to our algorithm YHE. So uh, what we will do, we'll compare uh, the cost our algorithm, the expected cost our algorithm pays to the LP value edge by edge. So for every, let's fix one edge. And let's define random variables. So xi is the uh, uh, amount of flow routed uh, from SI to TI via our edge E. Uh, this is, a, again, sort of Bernoulli random variable. It's either 0 or, or DI. Uh, and <coughs> just by the construction, all xi's are independent. And the cost algorithm pays for this edge is the CE times sum over i xi to the power of Q. So this is easy. So the xi depend on e, but you're suppressing that. Yeah, xi is, the, yeah, let's fix one edge and look edge by edge. Okay, <coughs> so the expected uh, cost of the algorithm for that particular edge is expectation c times the sum of xi to the power of u. And now for that particular edge, we had yi's, right? Again, all yi's are different for different edges, but now we fix one particular edge. And the LP cost, is equal to the expected number C E times sum of over I Y I to the power of Q. And we now need somehow to compare these two quantities. Uh, and uh, just by the construction, Y I has the same distribution as X Y. X -Y. So pairwise sort of X I has the same distribution as Y I. Again, this is a very simple Bernoulli random variable taking value zero and di. Uh, the difference is that all X I's are independent and Y I's are generally not independent. And <coughs> so we need to compare somehow these two quantities. And it turns out that uh, there is a decoupling inequality due to De La Pena from 1990. And it tells the following. So suppose we have a random variables y1, et cetera, yn, that's jointly distributed. And what's important, these random variables are non-negative. And x1, et cetera, xn are independent non-negative random variables uh, such that xi and xi has the same distribution as yi. Again, xi's are independent, y's, yi's are independent. Of course, we chose yi somehow to minimize this, the qth moment of the sum. Uh, so the, the qth moment of the sum of uh, yi's can be less than the qth moment for the sum of xi's, but the inequality says that it can be too much smaller. In other words, <coughs> this, the qth, qth norm of x1 plus et cetera xn is less than some constant cq uh, times the sum of uh, the, the qth norm of the sum of yi's. Okay, and so this inequality immediately tells us that the approximation, ratio, uh, uh, approximation algorithm we get has a constant approximation factor. Uh, you may be interested, okay, what is the constant? Uh, so in a uh, subsequent work, De La Pena, Ibrahimov, and uh, Sharakhmetov show that cq to the power of q, which is really the q what we need, uh, the qth power of, of this expression, uh, is less than two for q is in between one and two, and it is uh, pith, uh, sorry, qth moment of Poisson random uh, variable with parameter one for q greater than two. So these are the bounds. Again, somehow, for us, the most interesting regime is when q is between one and two, uh, particularly because maybe independent rounding is not the best thing to do uh, if q is larger, if this function is, grows too fast. Uh, so we already get two, two, two approximation from this. Uh, and then we, we improved this bound to p to the, uh, to, <coughs> to extended uh, the bound they had for q greater than two uh, for all q's. So for any q greater than one, and one including one, uh, we prove that c to the power of q equal to the norm of Poisson random variable with parameter one to the power of q. And so this is the result. And today I will uh, show you the proof. Uh, <coughs> and uh, before that, uh, maybe uh, I'll remind you some of, some of you what the Poisson distribution is. I was asked to do this before. Uh, uh, the, the first definition is, is really easy, but maybe not too intuitive. So uh, Poisson variable takes values from, from zero to infinity, in, integral values 
uh, from 0 to infinity, and the probability that p equals to k is lambda to the power of k times e to the power minus lambda divided by k factorial. What's important here, of course, that for us, for the future, that uh, a Poisson random variables take, takes only integral values, and a kind of a more natural definition in a way follows from the Poisson limit theorem. So imagine that we have a large universe of capital N points, and N is very large, and we uh, uh, pick every, every point here with probability lambda over capital N. So the number of points chosen is a, uh, the value of this Poisson random variable. So for example, maybe in this case we pick uh, two vertices with some probability, and it means that uh, the, the, the value of the Poisson random variable equals two in this case. Uh, it's also easy to see from this definition that the expectation of P lambda is equal to lambda. <coughs> okay, so what is the, how do we prove this theorem? Uh, roughly speaking, we massage all xi's and yi's and transform them to, to Poisson random variables. And so we got this proof um, when we submitted the, fir the paper first. Uh, and it was, uh, it was correct, but it was a little bit messy. And so we realized that to simplify the proof, maybe we need a different language. We got this hint from, from the Wall Street Journal, as you see here. And indeed, we, we, we looked for a different language and we found it. And uh, this language of convex stochastic orders, which, which I found quite interesting. <laughs> and so I'll tell you about this language now. <coughs> so this is some, some kind of detour from, from, from the problem from that inequality. Uh, so let's say that x is less than uh, y in the convex stochastic order if for every convex function phi, the expected value of e uh, so expected value of phi of x is uh, at most the expected value of phi of y. So this is a definition. Uh, it looks quite natural, even though it has somewhat uh, surprising properties. First of all, it's easy to see that this is indeed a partial order, right? If uh, x is less than y and y is less than z, then x is less than z in this convex order. Uh, it's a, this, 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 this order is really a property of distribution, not particular random variables, so it doesn't depend how specifically uh, these variables are coupled. And for example, e is x is distributed the same way as z, and x is less than y, then of course z is less than y as well. <coughs> okay, it's, it's, it's an order. Uh, it's true that x is less than x. It's, it's, it's also true, even though maybe not that easy to prove that uh, x is less than y, and y is less than x, then x is equal to y, almost surely. But I we won't use it here, and I won't prove it here. You, uh, you don't mean x equal to y, almost surely. You mean the distribution to the same. Right. Good. Exactly. Yeah, because it can be defined, of course, in different probability spaces. Uh, that's very good. Uh, then then uh, what's also true is that we rescale x and y. Uh, if x is less than y, then alpha x plus b is less than alpha y plus b. And particularly it says that if x is less than y, then minus x is less than y in this convex order, which is a bit counterintuitive. But if you look at this definition, sort of it makes sense, right? So it really doesn't matter what uh, sort of whether we change the sign or not. And what particularly it implies that the expectation of x equals to the expectation of y. There is a slightly different notion where you can actually increase y and you'll, you'll still have x less than y, but that's not uh, this notion of stochastic order. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> and uh, another property, okay, which, which is really um, not, not, not that important, but we'll, we'll use it here for, for simplicity, that we, of course, can always assume that phi of zero is equal to zero. So whenever, what I mean is whenever we want to check whether x is less uh, than y using this definition, we can always assume that phi of zero is equal to zero just because we can always shift our function by a constant and both sides of this inequality will shift by the same constant. What about the last Yeah, if x is less than y, then the expectation are equal. This just follows because if x is less than y, it turns out that minus x is also less than minus one. Uh, sorry, is less than minus y. 
Now, if you pick the function just to be identity, you'll get that the expectations are actually equal. And this is a bit counterintuitive property as is, but that's, that's the case. And another definition, equivalent definition, of, uh, is as follows. Again, we are, we are not going to, to use this definition now, but I think it's very, it really illustrates well what this order means. So if x is less than y, then we can uh, find the coupling of these uh, two random variables x and y on the same probability space. <laughs> so in, in a way, we can find even uh, some, uh, some random walk martingale, uh, and x is going to be equal to the value of this random walk at some uh, stopping uh, time tau 1, and uh, y is going to be equal to the value of this random walk at time tau 2. Uh, so it's possible to embed both of these random variables to the Wiener process. You can also think of this uh, martingale just uh, being a discrete uh, random walk with two, with two steps if you want. And it's easy to see uh, that this definition, if you have x and y defined like this, then x is less than y. This is really easy follows from the uh, Janssen inequality. In the opposite direction, it's not so easy. I mean, it's, it can be proved, but it's not so easy. <coughs> yeah, but this is maybe more natural even way to define x less than equal to y. So it really tells what, what happens. We first move to x, and then somehow we dissipate it to different direction and we get y. Yeah. Equivalent way to say this is that you can obtain x from y by conditioning on some sigma theta. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So here's some, some yeah, like I guess you wanted to say something about the condition between tau 2 and tau 1, huh? Yeah, tau 1 must be less than tau 2. Okay, yeah. That's equal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ta tau 1, in other words, uh, expected value of y given x is equal to x. You can couple again this distribution so that expected value of y given x is equal to x. So this is a martingale sequence. <coughs> okay, and um, let's, um, let's prove something, something very simple. Uh, suppose we have a Bernoulli random variable with parameter p and the Poisson random variable again with parameter p, uh, then uh, B is less than P in this convex order. Uh, and particularly, it, one property, of course, is already satisfied. The expectations are equal. Uh, but to prove it, let's look at convex function phi. And let's assume that phi of 0 is equal to 0. We can always assume that. Uh, so he, here is the picture of our convex function phi. Uh, look at a linear function that goes through this point 0, 0, and 1, um, 1, 1. This is just, okay, identity function. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, it's not 1, 1. It's uh, uh, f f 5, 1. 1, 5, 1. It depends on, f on 5. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, what is the expect expected value of phi of p? It's greater than expected value of this linear function of p. Why? Because uh, the Poisson random variable takes only integral values. And so for all integral values, phi of t is greater than L of t, right? It's, it's less only for fractional values in between 0 and 1. So we have this inequality. And of course, for li linear function, we can in interchange expectation with with, with this linear function. So it's equal to L of E of P, which is just P. Uh, and this is equal to linear function of this uh, Bernoulli random variable. Uh, and uh, for, for Bernoulli random variable, of course, we have just equality for, for all values that the Bernoulli random variable takes, right, for 0 and 1. So it's expected value of L of B, which is E of uh, phi of B. Uh, so we, we proved this. Uh, and this is, this is important for, for, uh, for the later proof. <coughs> and uh, another very important lemma, which really simplifies our proof, uh, is that if you have three random variables, x, y, z, uh, and all of them, let's say, are independent, and assume that uh, x is less than y in this convex order, then x plus z is less than y plus z. And the proof is, is, is immediate, so again, we look at some convex function phi, and we write that the expected value of 
uh, x plus z uh, is equal to the expectation over z, and here we condition on z, so a uh, phi of, here I think it's, um, there is, should be an extra bracket here, it's a uh, phi of z plus x given z, uh, and uh, now for, for a fixed z, of course, uh, phi of z plus x is also a convex function, uh, so we can say that this is less than expected value of phi of z plus y given z, again, it should be corrected here, what's written, uh, and this is equal to expected value of phi of y plus z given z. No, no z at the end. Uh, yeah, no z in the end. No yeah. condition. No condition, right. Yeah, and of course there should be extra, whatever, brackets, whatever. The brackets are not important, but the conditioning at the end. Yeah, and there is no condition here, right, good. Okay, but anyway, uh, this is really simple, uh, and, and then we can generalize it to, to, to more random variables. If you have random variables x1, etc., xn that are independent, and y1, yn that are independent, and every xi is less than yi, then we have that x1 plus, etc., xn is less than y1 plus yn. And uh, to prove it, we just apply the previous lemma one by one. We fix all variables but one and replace x by y. So the proof again is simple, and we get this inequality. Unfortunately, as is, uh, it can be applied in our case because, okay, in our case, <coughs> x is I independent, but y is, of course, not independent. Uh, and now le let me formulate what we want to prove uh, in this new language of convex order. So let's go back to our decoupling inequality. So the inequality we prove is as follows. Suppose again that y1, et cetera, y n are jointly distributed non-negative random variables and x1, et cetera, xn are independent copy of y1, et cetera, y n. <coughs> so then the sum x1 plus xn uh, is less in the convex order than the Poisson random va variable with parameter one times y1 plus et cetera, y n. And this Poisson random variable should be independent of y's. It doesn't really matter sort of whether it depends on x, x's or not. In, in, in fact, in the proof, we will couple this Poisson random vari variable with x's in a certain way. Okay, so suppose we prove this inequality. How do we get the De La Pena inequality? Uh, very easily, because we write that uh, expected value of x1 plus xn to the power of q is less than uh, just by the, uh, so, so this function uh, t to the power of q is convex, so using that x1 plus xn is less than p times y1 plus yn, we write that the expected value of x1 plus et cetera, xn to the power of q is less than expected value of Poisson random variable times y1 plus et cetera, yn to the power of q. Of course, p and y are independent, so I really write this inequality in this way, and this is exactly what we want to show. And of course, in general, this inequality is a little bit more general, and we can use, uh, we, we can prove inequalities like this, but for different functions, for other functions. <coughs> okay, and now you may ask why, uh, why Poisson random variable? Why do we get Poisson random variable at all here? And it's easier uh, to see from the tight case. So this, uh, this constant we, we show is indeed tight. It can be improved. And here is just a very simple example. Uh, so uh, let's take n random variables x1, xn. All of them are Bernoulli random variables with parameter 1 over n. And y1, et cetera, yn are also uh, uh, Bernoulli random variable by the, uh, they, just, they are not independent. Moreover, only one of them is equal to one. So essentially we pick just one index i from, from one to n and let y i to be equal to one and all other y j is equal to zero. So what we get is that uh, the sum of x1 plus et cetera xn is approximately distributed the Poisson random variable and the sum of y1 plus yn is always equal to one. Uh, so <coughs> we get that x1 plus et cetera xn approximately equals to p times y1 plus et cetera yn. And of course, we can to prove, so we can write that this is less than equal in the convex order, but we can to prove this inequality. Mm -hmm. So this is the optimal inequality when you want something that doesn't depend on n. 
But it's actually yeah. also suggested if you uh, think of a fixed n, maybe you can replace the Poisson by binomial n one over n. Yeah, I think you can. I mean, yeah, probably. It, 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 I don't think it's going to be a, a huge kind of improvement. Of course it's. Yeah. And for large n, it's a negligible improvement. Yeah. And it can be optimal for each n. Yeah. <coughs> um, OK. Uh, so now we need to prove this inequality. And let's first look at some very simple cases. Again, one, one case we just seen. So let, let's look at this case again. Uh, what, 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 we, what we know uh, that sum of x1 plus et cetera xn uh, uh, is less than Poisson times y1 plus yn, where uh, yi's are just like this. And uh, we can low bound the sum of x1 plus xn by sum of yi's. Again, sum of yi is equal just to 1. And again, so 1 is less than sum of x1 plus xn, particularly because the expectation of the sum x, xi is equal to 1. So it's the most basic, the most basic case. Um, now, can we make it a little bit more interesting, just slightly? Uh, let's uh, first maybe. We don't have to assume that they are uh, identically distributed, uh, but let's say x1, xn are some Bernoulli variables. Yi's are uh, uh, the same random variables, but somehow coupled between each other, so they have a joint distribution. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, let's assume that sum of yi's is, equal, is always equal to 1, as before. And it's, it's natural to think of yi's as being just indicator of some event. So we all, one of them always equal to 1, but at most 1. So those events are, are disjoint. Uh, uh, and um, we also have some constant, alpha 1, et cetera, alpha n, that are non-negative numbers. Uh, so the inequality we prove is that uh, sum of alpha i's, y i's, is less than sum of alpha i's x size in the convex order. And this sum of alpha i's x size is less than Poisson random variable times again sum of alpha i's y i's in the convex order. Again, if all alphas are the same, that's essentially the same case as before. Uh, maybe uh, uh, we don't assume here that x size have, uh, so, so here x size can have different distributions, but that, that's, that's not actually important. So, so you may think that. Uh, each xi is equal to 1 with probability 1 over n, almost without any loss of generality. The reduction is very simple. OK, uh, so let's assume for a second that we can generalize the previous argument to this case. And then I will show how the general uh, case follows from this. And then if I have time, I will, I will show you how to prove this inequality as well. <coughs> so let, let's go to the general case. Uh, and uh, let's look at this uh, space of different points. So we have our vector y, y1, et cetera, yn. And so here uh, are all possible outcomes of this vector y. So this is a space of small y, y1, et cetera, y, yn's. Uh, <coughs> let's write what the, the sum of yi's is. It is sum of a small, small y's in this space. Uh, times the indicator variable of capital Y equal to Y, and so, times the sum of YIs, right? So far, this is just uh, trivial, right? If Y, uh, cap uh, capital Y equals to Y, then of course the sum of uh, capital YIs equal to the sum of uh, a small YIs. Uh, and uh, essentially we have this, important variable, this characteristic uh, vector, uh, characteristic, sorry, in, indicator, uh, sorry, in, in, indicator variable, oops. So we have these variables, indicators of events that y is equal to y. Uh, this, these indicator variables uh, satisfy our previous uh, inequality. So only one of these uh, indicator variables equal to one, right? And so let's, let, 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 let's define a new variable, b sub y. b sub y is a Bernoulli random variable. Uh, and 
the probability that it is equal to one is exactly the same as the probability that this indicator variable equals to one. B sub y, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of this distributed exactly the, the same. But now let's make all these b's independent. In other words, uh, so the characteristic uh, sort of this indicator variable picks only one vertex uh, here, right, in this universe. Uh, and so let, let's allow to pick many of them, maybe, uh, with the same probability as we, we pick one. So we kind of decouple these events. Instead of picking one, sometimes we will pick maybe two or three, and sometimes none. And so now we have BYs. And we are going to compare <coughs> so this, this uh, for, for quantities in a moment and show that uh, some of what, what YIs is somehow, yeah, let, let's see what we are going to do. Uh, uh, so, uh, as before, we write that sum of yi is equal to the indicator of y equal to y uh, times yi. That's for one uh, yi. And uh, uh, xi is distributed the same way as yi. Right? So, we have this xi is equal to in distribution of sum of a small y's. Uh, indicator y equals to y times uh, the small yi. Uh, and now we apply the inequality we had before. So we uh, replace dependent variables by independent variables, b sub y. So we get that in the convex order, every xi is less than sum over y b y uh, times yi. And moreover, so let's make this by dependent on i. So in general, so, so in total, we'll have many Bernoulli variables b sub y. So for every i from 1 to n and for every uh, uh, small y in our space. <coughs> so, OK, uh, because all x i are independent. And OK, here we have index i for every by, which makes all b bi is independent, <clears throat> we get that sum over uh, i, xi, is less than the convex order of sum over i, sum over y, bi, y, yi. Uh, and this can be written like this, just we, we switch uh, the, the summation. And um, for uh, if now, now suppose we didn't have different, so, so this index i here, so we have only b y, then we, we would write that sum over y in this space y, b i, y i, b y uh, is less than Poisson random variable. Here we use uh, the other part of our uh, inequality we proved, sum over y in, in, in the space, uh, summation of again, yi times the characteristic vector of y equals to y, right? So we replace this by by this uh, indicator variable of y equals to y, and we get what, what we want. Uh, the only small caveat is that uh, here we assume that uh, we have different variables, by sub i, and they're independent, and here we replaced all of them by the same by. Uh, but, uh, okay, so this is, this is the only problem. Uh, it's easier to show that uh, this inequality holds uh, for any uh, variable b. This is just using Janssen inequality. And this finishes the proof. Yeah, this is, again, this is uh, maybe. What, I'm missing what you brought up here. Hmm? So the last thing about the semi convex, what, can you go to the last? This one? Yeah, so. Right, uh, yeah, so we. Um, so bi are independent, I don't understand. What it, so bi are independent copies of b? Yeah, bi is independent uh, uh, copies of b. And then actually, I, I, I think even it's not important that they're independent, but they, they are independent. What, what we, first of all, we can renormalize yi's, right? We may assume that yi's, sum of yi's is equal to one. 
Because if it's true for, for those, we can always rescale. And now we, we write sum of a phi of uh, sum i y i b i uh, is at most sum of uh, over i y i e of uh, phi of uh, b i. Uh, and this is equal to uh, now e expectation of again y i expected value of phi of b because b i is the same, has the same distribution as b. Uh, and now we, uh, yeah, we just uh, re regroup, yeah, uh, and uh, we, yeah, what's written here is, is probably not quite correct. What is it? What's the problem? No, no, okay. You have to push the sum inside up. Yeah, you, you pop. Uh, you, you. Uh, but question is, how did you get it by outside? The first inequality, is what did you use? Is a sum of yi. But that's, okay, the, the, but that's okay because the yeah, sum of yi is we assume to be equal to one. one right. so okay, this, this is just pi of p there. So, so okay. this, this sum is equal to one and we can write, in, you know, add okay. the sum inside. Yeah, if you don't assume that it's normalized, we should be a little bit, I mean, just divide whatever appropriate, appropriately. Yeah. Okay, so this, 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 this sort of uh, show prove this lemma, but what, what's important sort of in this proof is really that, yeah, we looked at this, we applied the previous inequality to the uh, elementary events here or to, to the indicators of these events that y e equals to a particular point. And everything kind of worked very well. Okay, now I can uh, show you the proof of the special case. Uh, again, it's uh, very simple. <coughs> so what we do is we, 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 we need to prove two, two inequalities, the first one and the second one. The first one, uh, it's particularly simple, so assume that phi uh, is a convex function with phi of zero equal to zero, then uh, phi is super additive, uh, so phi of a plus b greater than phi of a plus phi of b, particularly uh, phi of alpha one x one plus etc. alpha n x n is greater than phi of alpha one x one plus etc. phi of alpha n x n. And uh, on the other hand, uh, for these y's, we have sort of exact equality because only one of them uh, equals to uh, one because, right. Uh, and this, uh, this finishes the proof. In, in, the, in the opposite direction, uh, we first uh, use the fact that we just prove, prove that every x, so every xi is a Bernoulli random variable. Uh, so we can replace it by a Poisson random variable. That's what we've seen uh, as the first example of this convex order. So we replace x size with Poisson random variables having the same uh, expectation. And now what we say is that this Poisson random variable, which must be independent of y's, uh, it can be, however, dependent on this p's. So we say that p is the sum of p1, et cetera, p, pn. And then we just condition on p equals to, to some k. Uh, so essentially we, are, we can write here k, and now we have this p variables pi conditioned uh, on their total sum equal to k. Uh, and somehow now the left-hand side and right-hand side uh, look similar, so on both sides we have dependent ra random variables once we conditioned on the sum. So the sum is here, is k. Uh, of course, here only one of these variables equal to k, and all others are zero. And here they somehow smooth. Uh, uh, the sum is also equal to, 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 to k, but, but uh, it, it, it's possible that there are uh, several non-zero entries. And we use just again Jensen inequality. Uh, so let's uh, go maybe uh, line by line. We, uh, yeah, I don't know. We, we just uh, rewrite uh, 
our expression like, like, like this first. Now this uh, pi over k i coefficient, we, we think of the, this pi is over k to, as being some, 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 some coefficients that sum up to one. Uh, we use a uh, Janssen inequality here. So we write sum over pi over k times phi of alpha i um, k, again conditioned on p equals to k. Um, uh, and uh, now what, what's important is, is that uh, this value, expected value of pi over k given that p equals to k is easier uh, to compute. I mean, it, it is a known value. So it is just uh, the expected value of pi. And yeah, and we, we simplify the expression, we get what, what we need. Yeah, and that's uh, pretty, uh, pretty much it. Um, okay, so the conclusion that we, we, we gave this uh, framework that can be used again for energy minimization problems, it can also be used for various LP minimization problems. So if you want to minimize LP norm uh, and maybe minimizing some other convex and maximizing concave functions. Uh, yeah, and then we uh, found the exact constant in the, the Lapena inequality uh, and generalize it to, to con convex and concave functions. And I would say an interesting question if, if, if there are any other applications of this inequality. So that's it. <laughs> any questions? So why is it tight only for between one and two? What's and why not? Uh, no, the, the inequality is tight for any Q. The, 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 the inequality, but of course you can, you can use a different algorithm. You don't have to, to round everything independently. If you do, then, then this is tight. But maybe you can, you can use potentially different relaxation or you can try to, uh, yeah, to use some dependent rounding. Even the algorithm, you, it, it's possible that you can improve the algorithm for Q equal B between one and two, we don't know. But the inequality is tight for, for arbitrary Q. But for your convex uh, relaxation is tight? Uh, for, uh, hmm, question, uh, probably. I need to double check though.